Hi everybody, welcome to the next talk. This is going to be about aspects of real life action detection, architectures, efficiency and zero shot learning. This talk is in context of the human activity detection in continuous video workshop at WACWI 2021. My name is Hilde Kühne. I'm researcher at the MIT IBM Watson AI lab. And this work is a collaborative effort between Purdue University and IBM Research. First, I want to give you an overview of the following 20 minutes. I start with um, an overview of the IBM Purdue Diva architecture. I then continue with an analysis of spatial temporal models for action recognition. I will dive a bit deeper into aspects of efficient action recognition and close this talk with an outlook on our work on zero-shot action localization from textual descriptions. Let's start with an overview of our system. We take an input video and usually process three seconds chunks of this input video. We then run YOLO object detection to detect cars and persons and bicycles and take the maximum bounding box of those detections as input for our action classifier. The action classification is then done by two models, one trained on the IBM side and one trained on the Purdue side. We take the mean over both outputs as the action recognition for this chunk. And finally, add this to the overall list of actions for this video. As you can see from this overview, the heavy lifting in this whole architecture is done by the classifiers, which is why I want to talk a bit more about those approaches in the following slides. As we all know, we have seen an uh, ever-growing model zoom for action classification over the last years. This includes 2D convolutional models, 2 plus 1D, 3D models, but the question is which of those are really working? This is why we did a comparative study on action recognition models. To this end, we built a unified framework for fair comparison of those models. We unified the backbone, the training data, the pre-trained model, frame input, etc. The main focus is on the evaluation on the impact of temporal modeling, as well as on the trade-off of efficiency and accuracy of those models. The code for this framework is available on GitHub and the paper is available on Archive. Overall, we focused on three types of temporal modeling. 3D convolutions, 2D plus 1D convolutions, which are mainly 2D spatial convolutions and one-dimensional temporal convolutions, as well as models with temporal aggregation and pooling like TAM and TSN. To evaluate the impact of temporal modeling, we have chosen three representative models for each temporal modeling strategy. I3D for 3D convolutions, S3D for 2 plus 1D setup, and TAM for temporal aggregation. We run those models on a slim version of three different data sets, the something something version 2, kinetics and moments in time, for different number of input frames. Overall, it shows the temporal aggregation is able to outperform 3D and 2 plus 1D convolutional models. Another interesting finding is the impact of the number of input frames on the overall action classification accuracy. We see that depending on the data set, the jump from 32 to 64 frames of input makes a big difference as seen in the something something data set, or that it doesn't change accuracy at all as seen on the moments in time data set. Overall, we can conclude that the more time matters, the more the sampling strategy actually matters. To better understand this effect, we looked more closely at different sampling strategies. We compared the two best performing models 
I3D and TAM with two different sampling strategies, dense and uniform sampling, and run this setting on two different datasets, Kinetics, which has a strong focus on spatial properties, and Something Something, which is more focused on the temporal aspects of actions. Overall, we can see that there is not a big difference in terms of sampling on the Kinetics dataset, no matter which model we choose. Actually, accuracy stays very close, no matter if we use dense or uniform sampling or if we use I3D or the TAM model. It makes a big difference when we look at something. This is actually good news because uniform sampling is usually more efficient than dense sampling as it needs less overall input frames. So the question is, how can we use this finding to actually build more efficient action recognition architectures? To more precisely understand the progress in action recognition, we further conduct a benchmark effort, including I3D, TAM and slow fast on the full data sets. I3D represents the prior state-of-the-art approach for action recognition, while SlowFast and TAM are arguably the existing state-of-the-art methods on kinetics and something-something. To ensure apple-to-apple -apple comparison, we follow the practice of SlowFast to train all the models and select ResNet50 and ResNet101 as backbone. During training, we take 64 consecutive frames from a video and sample every other frame as input. 32 frames are fed into the model. During evaluation, we uniformly sample 10 clips from a video and then take three crops of each clip. The accuracy of a video is conducted by averaging over 30 predictions. As can be seen from the table, by using a stronger backbone and removing temporal pooling in I3D, it greatly stretches I3D to be on par with state-of-the-art approaches in accuracy on both benchmark datasets. Our results show that I3D remains as one of the most competitive approaches for action recognition and that the progress of accuracy on action recognition is largely due to the use of more powerful backbone networks. Nevertheless, we do observe that recent approaches have made significant progress on computational efficiency. We take this as a motivation to further investigate how we can build models more efficiently and more accurate at the same time. So the question is, what do we really need for action recognition? In this context, I would like to present three works from our lab that all deal with the problem of how to recognize actions in an efficient way without losing accuracy. The first work, ARNet, Adaptive Frame Resolution for Efficient Action Recognition, deals with the question if and when we need to process frames at full resolution and when a low resolution would actually be enough. The second work, at a FUSE, Adaptive Temporal Fusion Network for Efficient Action Recognition, picks up on this idea, but instead of looking at a resolution, it tries <coughs> to remove redundant computations by reusing past frames to save computation time. The third work, VR Red 2, Video Adaptive Redundancy Reduction deals with the idea that an inherent property of real-world video is the high correlation of information across frames, which can translate into redundancy in either temporal or spatial feature maps of the model or both. This type of redundant features depends on the dynamics and type of events in the video. The here presented Redundancy Reduction Framework, VR Red 2, uses an input-dependent policy to decide how many frames need to be computed for temporal and channel dimensions. We can reconstruct the remaining redundant frames from these using cheap operations. Overall, all three models show how we can significantly reduce the number of computations while keeping or improving action classification accuracy. So let's start with ARNet. ARNet 
our adaptive resolution network selects on the fly the optimal resolution for each frame conditioned on the input of effic for efficient action recognition in long untrimmed videos. Rather than processing all frames at the same resolution, it learns a policy to select the optimal resolution or even skip a frame that is needed to recognize correctly an action in a given video. As can be seen from the figure, here the seventh frame is the most useful for recognition. Therefore, it will be processed with the highest resolution, while the rest of the frames could be processed at lower resolutions or even be skipped without losing any accuracy. As you can see from the figure, ARNet consists of a policy network and different backbone networks corresponding to different resolutions. The policy network decides what resolution to use on a per frame basis or to skip the frame to achieve accuracy and efficiency. In training, policies are sampled from a Gumball Softmax distribution, which allows to optimize the policy network via backpropagation. During inference, input frames are first fed into the policy network to decide the proper resolutions. Then the rescaled frames are routed to corresponding backbones to generate predictions. Finally, the network averages all the predictions for action classification. During training, we use the standard cross-entropy loss to measure the classification accuracy. We also use the G-flops per frame as a loss term to punish for high computation operations. Furthermore, to encourage the policy learning to choose more frames for skipping, we add an additional regularization term to enforce a balanced policy usage. Policy learning in the first stage is extremely sensitive to initialization of the policy. We observe that optimizing for both accuracy and efficiency is not effective with a random initialized policy. We therefore divide the training process into three stages, warm-up, joint training and fine-tuning. For warm-up, we fix the policy network and only train the backbone network. Then the whole pipeline is jointly trained for 50 epochs. After that, we fix the policy network parameters and fine tune the backbone networks for another 50 epochs with a lower learning rate. All source code and models are publicly available on GitHub. In the ablation study, among others, we evaluate the effectiveness of choosing the right policy method, namely resolution and skipping. We inspect how each type of operation enhances the efficient video understanding, considering three different action spaces. Resolution only, the policy network can only choose between different resolutions. Skipping only, where the policy network can only decide how many frames to skip, and a combination of both resolution and skipping. We evaluate each approach on the ActivityNet dataset. We adjust the training loss to keep the G-flops at the same level, and we only compare the differences in classification performance. As shown in the first table, Comparing with the baseline methods, Uniform and LSTM, they all improve the performance and the best strategy is to combine skippings and choosing resolutions. Intuitively, skipping can be seen as choosing zero resolution for the current frame, hence gives more flexibility in decision making. Additionally, we had a look at the trade-off between accuracy and efficiency. Here, we train our model using three different loss combinations. Accuracy uses only accuracy-related losses. Accuracy and efficiency uses accuracy and efficiency loss. And accuracy and efficiency and regularization uses all three losses. As shown in the second table, training with accuracy alone will achieve the highest mean average precision but the computational cost will be similar to uniform method in the previous table. Adding the efficiency loss term will decrease the computational cost drastically, whereas training with accuracy, efficiency and regularization will drop the G-flops even further. One reason is that the network tends to skip more frames in the inference stage with this training method. 
we compare the performance of ARNet with several state-of-the-art methods on ActivityNet and FCVID. Usually, it's hard to improve the classification accuracy while maintaining a low computational cost, but our ARNet outperforms all the state-of-the-art methods in terms of mean average precision, frame-level GFLOPs, and video-level GFLOPs. This shows the power of our adaptive resolution learning approach in efficient video understanding. The figure further illustrates the GFLOPs mean average precision curve on the ActivityNet dataset, where our ARNet obtains significant computational efficiency and action recognition accuracy with much fewer GFLOPs than other baseline methods. Given the same ResNet architectural family, our approach achieves substantial improvement compared to the best competitors demonstrating the power of our method. An intuitive view of how ARNet achieves efficiency is shown in this figure. We show qualitative examples on the ActivityNet dataset. Videos are uniformly sampled in eight frames. The upper row of each example shows the original input frames and the lower row shows the frames processed by our policy network for predictions. ARNet keeps the most indicative frames in original resolution and resizes or skips frames that are irrelevant or in low quality, for example because of blurriness. After being confident about the predictions, ARNet will avoid using the original resolution even if informative content appears again. The examples show that ARNet is able to capture both object interaction and background changes. In the second approach, we propose Adafuse, an adaptive temporal fusion network that learns a decision policy to dynamically fuse channels from current and history feature maps for efficient action recognition. The idea here is simple. Just reuse what you have. So not every frame and channel needs to be computed from scratch. Instead, we want to reuse history features whenever possible, which means dynamically deciding which channels to keep, reuse or skip per layer and per instance, with the goal of improving both recognition accuracy and efficiency. As these decisions are discrete and non-differentiable, we rely on a Gumball softmax sampling approach to learn the policy jointly with the network parameters to standard backpropagation without resorting to complex reinforcement learning. Our policy network consists of two fully connected layers and a ReLU function designed to adaptively select channels for keeping, reusing or skipping. As shown in the figure, at time t, we first generate feature vectors from history feature maps in yellow and current feature maps in blue via global average pooling. The 2D conf layer computes for those keep channels in blue the feature map and fuses the reused channels in yellow from the history feature map. The downstream 2D convolutional layer will process those reuse and keep channels. Our adaptive temporal fusion module can be easily plugged into any existing 2D CNN models. We show the accuracy, computational cost and model sizes in the first figure. All the results are computed on the something something v1 validation set. The graph shows GFLOPs versus accuracy on the x and y axis, and the diameter of each data point is, the proportion, is proportional to the number of model parameters. Adafuse, shown in blue, owns the best trade-off for accuracy and efficiency at a comparable model size to other 2D CNN approaches. The second figure shows the overall policy usage for skip, reuse and keep across all data sets. We focus on the fraction of reuse and skip as this indicates the performance gain. We see that on something something v1 and v2 and adjuster datasets, those are very high when comparing to minikinetics. This is probably because the first three datasets contain more temporal relationship than kinetics. Moreover, Jester has the highest percentage in skipping, 
which indicates many actions in this data set can be correctly recognized with few channels. Those policy patterns further show different characteristics of data sets, which also conveys the potential of our proposed approach to be served as a data set inspector. In our third approach, VR2 video adaptive redundancy reduction, we make use of the fact that there is a high correlation of information across frames, which leads to redundancy in spatial and or temporal feature maps. The type of redundant features depends on the dynamics and type of events in the video. To increase the efficiency, we try to replace full computation of some redundant feature maps with cheap reconstruction operations. The goal is to only calculate those non-redundant parts of feature maps and reconstruct the rest. We learn the adaptive policy jointly with the network weights in a differentiable way with the shared weight mechanism, making it highly efficient. To this end, we try to dynamically reduce the redundancy in two dimensions. For example, in the first figure, we, sh we show an image where the input video has little movement. Here, the features in the temporal dimension are highly redundant, so our framework fully computes a subset of features and reconstructs the rest with cheap linear operations. In the second figure, we show that our framework can reduce computational complexity by performing a similar operation over channels. Only part of the features along the channel dimension are computed and cheap operations are used to generate the rest. We adopt a lightweight policy layer called soft modulation gate for each convolutional layer to modulate the ratio of features which needs to be computed. This decision is made on a per-input basis. Our policy layer learns an input-dependent policy that defines a full computation ratio for each layer of a 2D or 3D network. To encourage our network to output a computational efficient subgraph, we again resort to a combination of accuracy and efficiency loss function. The first table shows the results of action classification on the moments in time dataset for two different architectures with and without dynamic model training. Our proposed approach significantly reduces the computational costs while improving the accuracy. We also extend our method to the spatial temporal action localization task. We apply our method on JHMDB21 with two different 3D backbone networks, I3D Inception V2 and X3D M. We report frame mean average precision and recall value at IOU threshold of 0.5 and classification accuracy of correctly localized detections to measure the performance of the detector. The second table shows that our dynamic approach outperforms the baseline on all three metrics by offering significant savings in flops. In summary, VRED2 is able to improve baseline architectures in terms of both accuracy and computation costs on both recognition and localization tasks, making it suitable for efficient video understanding. Last but not least, I want to present our take on zero-shot action localization, multimodal clustering networks for self-supervised learning from unlabeled videos. The idea here is that we want to learn a common space by clustering multimodal features. This can be visual representations from frames, speech or text. We want to project those features in a common space by pairwise contrastive loss, while at the same time performing clustering over those multimodal features in the same common space. To learn this common space, we actually want to combine two ideas. Contrastive learning, which samples usually negative pairs without considering semantics, and clustering, which usually clusters each modality individually with no multimodal interaction. To combine those two, we just perform clustering in a joint space for all three modalities.
Our ablation study shows that clustering is essential for any classification related task and that the joint space actually encourages a semantic closeness over different domains. Overall, we get state-of-the-art numbers in zero-shot action retrieval and detection with the proposed method. This concludes my talk and I want to thank all people who put a lot of work and effort into all those projects. Thanks for listening.